Please remain standing if you're able for the reading of God's word. I'll be re reading from Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Please be seated. Let's pray again. Father, we're so grateful for our open Bibles and, and the opportunity, as Jean has prayed, that we have to be gospel lights in a very dark world. And so, Lord, as we hear your word, may we hear from you. May you touch every heart. May we be as though we're the only person in the sanctuary beholding the glory of you through your word. And may you change us. May you change us so that we may be change agents in our world, if it be your will. And we thank you for, again, the privilege of being here. Thank you for the way you've protected us. And, and so, Father, make our time profitable for our souls and that we would indeed be more and more like Christ, more and more burdened like Christ, more and more seeing the world like Christ, and thus moved into the world with compassion, with mercy, and with the gospel. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it certainly is good to see all of you, and uh, it's nice to see the, uh, the increase of us getting together, and I know you value that very much, and I hope that we don't take it for granted, uh, what has been removed. And so, as I mentioned last week, we're going to depart and, and begin a series on human suffering, injustice, and the Christian response. And we're going to do this uh, for some time because I believe the times warrant such. I also believe that we are in dire need as, as Christendom, as the church, because we are to be the solution. We are to be the moral fiber that God may indeed use to bring a nation to righteousness, to its knees first and thus to, to righteousness. And we begin last week by going back to the Garden of Eden and the fundamental core issue that's facing society today. It's not a horizontal problem. It's not a political problem. It's not an educational problem, it is a spiritual problem. And thus the spiritual problem goes all the way back in the Garden of Eden when man ruptured his relationship with God. Before the fall, we looked at last week and we saw not the hand of God, but we saw the heart of God and how benevolent he was in giving to his first uh, creation, his choice creation. We saw the harmony. We saw that before the fall, there was no racism. There was no division. There was no injustice. There was no strife. There was no hatred. There was no conflict. And then we saw the fall, and all that ugliness took hold in the human heart. And it's lived out every day in our world. And so the Christian response, what do we do? What do we do? What is our responsibility to a decaying and dying world around us? And I believe the answer is simple. I don't believe it's easy, but I believe it's simple. And I believe it is the recovery of the biblical church. 
I believe it is the recovery of first love in the church. It will not be us going out and doing, it will us becoming that will lead to our doing. And so what I want to look at today and begin in the response that we are to ha- <clears throat> excuse me, we are to have in our culture is to go to the church at Ephesus. And if you have your Bibles to the Revelation chapter 2, the text that Bob read, I want us to begin to look at what I believe is the fundamental problem in Christendom, the fundamental challenge I face in my own life, and the only solution to bring humanity in a reconciled state with their Creator. And that is the church of Jesus Christ recovering what the church at Ephesus had lost, and that is first love. But before we look at this uh, problem uh, in the Ephesus church, we need to realize two things. Is number one, what we read of the Ephesus church in the Revelation was not what they were. They didn't start out like this. And the second thing that we need to be aware of when we look at the problem in the Ephesus church is that this is a warning. This is a warning for us. It's a warning for us as individual Christians. It's a warning as churches that are committed to right orthodoxy. Is that you can have right doctrine, right practice, right standing in the culture, and yet miss the main thing. And this is exactly what Christ says to the church. He says, I know your deeds, I know your works, I know your practices, I know uh, that you are confronting evil in the culture, yet you've missed the main thing, or I should say, you have lost the main thing, and that is first love. Now, when you go back to the Ephesus church, I want to give you a background here why this is important for us. And I'll stress this uh, ad nauseum to you, is that I firmly am convinced the church needs to recover love for Christ again. And the power of a transformed life. We will change culture if God allows us one heart at a time by a mobilized church that is absolutely consumed with Jesus Christ and his gospel. And the church at Ephesus, when they started out, they were a church of first love. You can read the account in Acts chapter 19. Paul spends two years uh, there and this was the key city in Macedonia. This was, the, this was the hub of all activity. One of the seven great wonders uh, uh, of the world, the, the Temple of Diana was there. It was, it was a mess, but it was a very influential place. And the church was planted there in Acts 19, and they were influential. Paul spent two years there, and it changed. People were going out of business because of revival that was happening in Ephesus. The silversmiths were losing business because of conversion. And it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 18 through 20, it says, Many who are now believers confessed and turned away from their wicked ways. And it continued on. It says, So the word of the Lord continued and increased mightily. That's exactly what we need in America today. Is an increase of biblical integrity in the church. And as Gene says, the unflinching fearlessness to say, Thus saith the Lord with deep compassion and sacrifice. The Ephesus church in its first generation was influential. Why? First love. They've been radically changed and first love gripped them and it mobilized them and thus Ephesus was changed. That's the first generation. What happens in the second generation of the church? Well, they maintained. They maintained and deepened first love. In the second generation of the church at Ephesus, we get the, we get the letter to the Ephesians. And if you read the letter to the Ephesians, you're going to find that love dominates that book. Twenty times in all, the word love appears in the the letter to the Ephesians. And in that context, it's always affirming. There's There's no mention there of a loss of. In fact, Paul would summarize the healthy climate of this church in its passionate first love by saying in Ephesians 1.15, For this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And then the whole letter. The whole letter tells us what the church is to be like. And so it's a very positive first love that was, that was planted in the first generation, continued into the second generation. 
And it's an interesting side note, and this is very important for us, is that when saving faith in Christ is present, so is impartial, sacrificial love for people. When true faith in Jesus Christ grips a person and a church, impartial love is what flows from that Christian and from that church. Well, what happened? What happened in, in Ephesus that went from first and, and second generation white-hot love for Christ? We come to the third generation and the letter from the Lord Jesus. And Jesus was, as Bob read, I'm not going to read it again, but Jesus says, everything looks good. On the outside, you look great. Your activities are noble. He commends them. He commends them for their, uh, for their stand. But then the saddest thing that could ever happen to a Christian and a church, the absolute worst thing that the head of the church could ever say to one of his people or his church, you have lost your first love. You have abandoned your first love. Now, this is not a new experience with the Ephesus church. And I would argue that this is a challenge you and I face every day with all the pressure and all the busyness and all the distractions in life is that the attack of the devil is an attack on your heart for first love. If he can get your heart and your affections, you're done. But then it becomes religiosity without power. It becomes influence of religion but not a spirituality. And so that's why the warning sign is so clear from the church at Ephesus, the Lord himself. And what I believe is the fault of our nation is not the fault of, of policies. It is the fault of the passivity of the church of Jesus Christ. It is her loss of love for the head of the church, for the triune God. And it happened in the Old Testament. A sad account in Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth. Now listen to the heart of God here for his people. It's just like the Genesis account. We see the heart of God towards his people. And now in Jeremiah, the Lord says, I remember your devotion. I remember the devotion of your youth. I remember your love as a bride. How you followed me in the wilderness. You see the heart cry of God? He's saying, I remember those days of intimacy. I remember those days of closeness. I remember those days when you and I walked in a oneness, even in the howling wilderness of the world. He goes on to say, But hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. What wrong did your fathers find in me that, went, that they went far from me and went, af went after worthlessness? And became worthless. Beloved, see the broken heart of God when his people abandoned the main thing. And the whole of the Christian life is a Christian life of love. The book was published in 1677. I've recommended it and I hope you'll read it. He begins his book by saying this. Quote, the life of Christianity consists very much in our love to Christ. Without love to Christ, we are as much without spiritual life as a carcass when the soul is fled from it is without natural life. Faith without love to Christ is a dead faith. And a Christian without love to Christ is a dead Christian, dead in sins and trespasses. Without love to Christ, we may have the name of Christian, but we are holy without the nature of Christian. We may have a form of godliness, but we are holy without the power. End quote. That was Thomas Vincent. His book, True Love to the Unseen Christ, as I mentioned, published in 1677. It could have been published yesterday. Vincent would reveal the remedy for what plagues humanity. And it is the healing of relationships by the controlling power of Christ's love. And thus the marching orders are for the Christians not to get busy and go do something, but it's to recover first love which produces the right activity Vincent would go on and say quote give me thine heart is the language of God to all the children of men and give me thy love is the language of Christ to his disciples what a beautiful statement friends do you see the heart of God like that do I see the heart of God that yearns for his people not to abandon first love 
Do you see the heart of God that woos us from the world to the eternal world to bask in the glory of his love for us that produces first love? As I mentioned, Christianity is a message of love. It's not the message of worldly love. The world has hijacked the word love. They don't even know what it means. It's all about infatuation, it's all about emotionalism, it's all about sentimentality, it's all about those things that has no substance. Has no substance. But Christianity is a message of love. It is an enduring virtue for eternity. Think about it for a minute. Faith will end someday. We are going to surrender faith for sight. So faith isn't eternal. Hope isn't even eternal. Because our hope in the unseen is going to become literal reality. But what will endure forever? Two things. Love and people. And those two are inseparable in the Christian life. And so I can't stand back and watch the news and bewail what's happening in my society and not be moved and not be moved by first love that causes me to weep with those who weep and enter into the, into the realm of loving them as Christ loves us. But if we're going to recover first love, and I'm not going to give you a recipe to recover this. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go, I'm not going to exhort you to go and do something. I really want to bore down on this because I see in my own life a desperate need for this to happen. And I see in the, in, in the state of our church, and it's not a judgment on any of you, but I see that we definitely need for God to revive us with first love. The church needs to be a force for change, but a force for change that comes from an otherworldliness about us that causes the real change, and that is heart transformation, not moral reformation. And so if we're going to experience this, the recovery of first love... I want, to, I want to caution us because, and, and keep this in the right context, the Christian life is not passive. You cannot reduce Christianity to just what God does to us. Yes, he does stuff to us, but we are called to a life of diligence, a life of discipline, a life of self-denial, a life of, of other-centeredness. There is, there is an, a balance in the Christian life. And that's why the prayer of Ephesians 3, which we've been praying for, and I hope you never grow tired of praying that prayer, where Paul prays that we would be strengthened in our inner being. Why? So that we would know the love of Christ. I'm not praying the prayer of Ephesians 3 that God strengthen me and I can get through a tough day because my life is, is going through some difficulty. That's not the prayer. The prayer is that we would be empowered by God to know God to experience his love so that we would infiltrate the world with that message. And so if you and I want to be agents of change, then number one, we've got to confess that we're lacking first love. Secondly, we have got to commit to praying that Ephesians 3 prayer, not mechanically, but fervently, that God would send revival and show us the incredible power of his love. To be overwhelmed by the love of Christ. And the second thing that we need to make sure that we're seeking is to be controlled by his love. Now, this is a very familiar verse, and all of you probably have memorized this verse. Paul would say to the Corinthians, for the love of Christ controls me. Now, if I sit down with you immediately after the service, and, and single, all of you line up, and I'm going to ask you the same question. What would a life look like that's under the control of Christ's love? What, what would take me from, I know this verse, I quote it all the time. But what would make me go from quoting it to living it? What would it look like in the life of a church and a Christian that knows about the constraining, controlling power of Christ in their life, his love? That's a big question. That's a big question. But there are three certainties that if you and I know anything about the love of Christ, if we know anything what it means to be controlled by his love, three things, at least three things, and the first one is this. We will see a noticeably decrease in selfishness. You simply cannot be encountering the love of Christ and changed by the love of Christ and live me, my, and mine. It's impossible. 
The whole purpose of Christ's coming was to destroy self-love, not to promote self-love. So if we're under the control of Christ's love and we are enjoying first love, one of the key characteristics will be this noticeably lack of selfishness. The second thing that will be present in a life under the control of Christ's love is that we will be so burdened for the gospel that we will be salt and light in the culture. Can't be otherwise. It is absolutely impossible to know the love of Christ and to remain passive in the work of the gospel to a dying culture. It's, it can't happen. And there's a third thing that will be present in a life that experiences first love and under the control of Christ's love is that we will have deep spiritual relationships with other Christians. We won't be on the fringe of body life. You can't. You can't. And those are three things that will always be present when God is granting us revival of first love. And so, when you think about the very answer to the culture today, it truly is. It truly is a revived church. A church that understands why it's on the earth. And a church that has so encountered the love of Christ that is transformational. And it produces within them an utter hatred for selfishness, a burden for the gospel, and then to be that agent of change in deep spiritual relationships with other Christians. So that's by way of introduction. So you can see we're going to spend some time on this. And I want us to date, I want us to begin to, as I mentioned, bore down on this. I don't apologize for for the depth and the length of this because, as I mentioned, I I grow more and more convinced this is the greatest need in my life. I I don't want to do church. And I don't want to do Christianity. I want to be a Bible Christian and a Bible church. And so what we're going to do is we're going to approach this uh, loss of first love in two ways. Not sure how far we'll get today. And when Gene mentioned the bulletin will be mailed to you, also the sermon outline, so that you can follow along and study on your own. But we're going to approach this loss of first love, the problem that plagued the Ephesians church, that could easily become our problem individually and the church. If not, it hasn't already. We're going to approach it on two two ways. Number one, what we must recover, that is the first love of Christ. We're going to look at it by defining first love. We're going to identify what it looks like when it's thriving in a Christian and a church. And then we're going to look at the negative. What does it look like at a Christian church when first love is truly lost? And then we'll look at the example of the Thessalonians of how to recover it biblically. And then after we go through that, we want to look at the uh, implication for the culture in which we live and what we must abandon. You know, when loss of first love, I'm getting ahead of myself on this, but you know what happens in a Christian? You know, and I, this is a, a personal conviction is that when a Christian loses first love, they become isolated from the world. Jesus says, be separate from the world. Separation is not isolation. And when you lose first love, we almost become a subculture within the culture. The Christian is on one track, and the world is on the other, and we occasionally go in with some type of event or some type of strategic gospel bombing, and then we go back out. That's what happens when you lose first love. And we'll look at what we got to do to recover that. But first, let's take a look at at, uh, first love defined. If you want to join with me in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. I want to begin by defining first love since the world has literally taken the the word love, redefined it anti-biblically. Worldly love, even in the most intimate of relationships, such as marriage, it always has a sinful, selfish component to it. Human love always has a sinful, selfish component to it, not first love. And when you look at first love, it's defined. Jesus would tell us the seriousness of this, of this experience and this truth being lost. Some of the translations, when he says, you have left your first love, I think the ESV says that. Some of the other translations add force to it. This is what it says. When Jesus says, you've left your first love, here's some other translation. You have given up. You have forsaken. 
Your love isn't what it was at first. You do not love me as you did at first. You no longer love me as you did in the beginning. Your first love, you have let it go. That's the heart of Christ over a Christian in church that has allowed that to happen. Now, when you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 5, we're going to read that in a minute. And you do a study of love in the scripture, the New Testament in particular, you come up with two dominant words. Again, as Bible scholars, you know this. But there's two dominant words in the New Testament for love. The first one is phileo. Phileo. And that means a brotherly love or a brotherly affection. It's very limited in scope. It's about, a, it's about having a natural affection for someone, and normally in the context of family. This is not the love that Jesus mentions in Revelation. It's not a brotherly love. It's not an affectionate love. The other word that the New Testament uses to describe love, as you, as you would know, is agapeo. That is the love that's defining of God. It's always in the context of God's love. It's not of human generation. It's not of human emotion. It's always describing the love of God in his character. God is love. And in his actions, God so loved. This is how the word love is defined. And if you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul, Paul says this is the result of being justified by faith. You know what justification by faith does to the Christian? It produces first love. He says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's agapeo has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Friends, left to ourselves, we are incapable of loving God and we are incapable of sustaining love for people. I don't have agapeo love by nature. I have God's love shed in my heart, Romans 5, 5, by virtue of new birth. Any attempt to love apart from new birth will always fail. Because it has no sustaining power outside of yourself. And thus when we define first love, we cannot reduce that down to just some affection for people or affection for God. It has to be the radical understanding that God himself, who is love, has planted that in me so that I can love him. Now think about that for a minute. That, is, that blows the mind away that God loved us when we were enemies, that we were haters of God. He so loved us that he would give us the capacity to love him. That is so freeing to the soul. Because when I'm commanded to love my brothers and sisters, and I don't look at the fact that God has enabled me my new birth to do that, I am going to fail miserably. Contrary to what you may think, I'm a very self-centered person. I want to be served more than I want to serve. And unless God's love changes me and enables me to practice first love to him and to others, then there is no hope for me being an agent of change in the culture. Do you know what will happen? Is you'll grow weary in serving others, and you'll get, you'll get grumpy, maybe even bitter, because you're being underappreciated or taken for granted or no one recognizes you. you know, that's, that's earthly. When you say, well, no one's noticing, or I'm tired, I need a break, that's earthly. Agapeo is power. It's love that enables us to live above those things. And so when we define first love, we need to understand that first love is first love that comes from him who first loved. And that should cause you to swell up with joy and, and, and dependency that God is commanding us to love, to change culture according to his will in a power that he gives us. Remember this, that there's nothing else of value today. In the Christian life, we always receive to give. It doesn't matter what it is. Yourself, your talents, your gifts, your money, your, your material, it doesn't matter. Freely you have received, freely you give. And your joy will be directly proportionate to how much of that you live. Is that the Christian life is all about getting to give. We are not hoarders of God's grace and love, but we are dispensers of God's grace and love. And the only way you can sustain that is by walking in first love, is walking under the control of Christ's love. 
I hope by now that you may be feeling uh, a sense of weightiness that I really do need to recover first love. I hope that that's happening in you right now. I hope that maybe you're walking in the power of first love. I hope so. But if you're not, I hope that this is awakening you and you're thinking, wait a minute. I really don't see this, that present in me. And I profess to be a Christian, right doctrine, right practice, but where is first love? Where is the selfless life? Where is the gospel burdened life? Where is the life in, involved in spiritual health and, and welfare of other Christians? That's a good place to be. Because what did Jesus tell was the cure to the Ephesian church? Repent and go back. Go back, and we're going to look at that. But we're working on now the definition of first love. Now, it's important to see what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say that the love of God had been removed from you. That's impossible. When you're justified, the Holy Spirit shed his love in your heart. You're sealed. It's impossible to lose that. So Christ is not saying you have forever abandoned first love. It's gone. It's gone. He didn't say that. But what he did say was that you have quenched and grieved the spirit of love so much, it's as if you don't have first love. And the evidence that that's occurring is that we're making no impact. No impact in our homes, no impact in our communities, no impact in our nature. Now, I'm not, I, I want to be careful with that because I'm not telling you to measure success by, uh, by what we see. But faithfulness and first love living will always have impact. We may not see it. Again, again, God may give us glimpses of fruit. But regardless, is Jesus did not say it's gone forever. What he did say is you can be living in such a manner that first love is barely alive. And hence, we find influence so little. Now, it's important that we own a lot of stuff that's happening in our country. And when we lament young people that's walked away from the faith, and hear me right here, don't misquote me. When we lament the young people have walked away, we're not responsible for them to own the faith. But we need to ask the question, did we model it? Did they see Christ-centered living in my life every day when I raise my kids? When I'm, doing my, my, when I'm attending my funeral, when my sons and my daughter, my wife say, you know, he wasn't a perfect dad, he wasn't a perfect husband, uh, but he certainly was a man who loved Christ and it showed in how he oriented his life. That's what first love does. But Jesus says that they had lost it. Not permanently, but they had lived in such a manner that it reflected as if it really was gone. Remember what Jesus says about salt and light. If the salt has lost its, its savor, it's good for nothing. And so the first love defined, here's the definition. Here's the definition I worked up for my own sake I'll share with you. The first love may be defined as the love of God in the heart of the believer that empowers him or her to faithfully obey the great commandments to love God, our neighbors, and the one another commands in the body of Christ. Okay, I know it was fast, and I know it was long. You know, I read a lot of books with long sentences. But notice, you know, I'll say it again. If you want the quote, just contact the office, and Joy can send it to you. Is quote, the, the first love is defined as the love of God in the heart of the believer that empowers him or her to faithfully obey the great commandments to love God, our neighbors, and the one another commands in the body of Christ. That would be a very attractive Christian life. That would be a very attractive church. It's to live out a love that is shed in our heart, that empowers us to faithfully obey the great commands to love God and our neighbors and one another commands in the body. So that's first love defined. Let's look at first love present. How do I know? I mentioned some certainties in the very beginning. But I want us to look at three areas uh, that indicate first love is, is really thriving in our hearts. And more often than not, we may, we may look at these and say, well, I've lost that. I've lost that. Not permanently. 
And I hope that is the conclusion. That we may be infirm in some areas, but we need to really ask the hard question, is this present in my life? And so why did the, the Ephesians lose first love? What happened? How do you go from a first generation white hot, second generation white hot, to third generation, it's barely alive? How, how did that happen? Now, we don't know the total, totality of it, but there is one thing that will always produce loss of first love. And it's when you lose the awe and the wonder and the amazement that you're a Christian. First love will begin to wane and begin to cool when you lose the wonder and amazement of new life in Christ. Remember when you first became a Christian? Remember the newness? Remember when the, 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 the blinders were taken off? And every, everything took on a freshness about it. You saw for the first time in your life truth. You were liberated from yourself. And first love burned in your hearts with great zeal. There was a, a, a and, and some of you, I mean, doesn't mean your conversion had to be dra drastic. Lydia's wasn't. But anytime new birth occurs, there is the freshness the newness that's associated with being a, a, a new creature in Christ. Do you remember the spiritual honeymoon phase you were in when you came to Christ? Do you remember almost the giddiness that he was your everything? I remember I first became a Christian, and, and, and don't use other people's experiences as models, but I'll just share mine. I remember I came home from a cruise. I left, I left for deployment not a Christian, and I came back as a Christian, and I went home, and I had a ton of zeal and absolutely zero knowledge. I was a dangerous person. And my mom took me aside, and she said, what happened to you? Did you join a cult? She said, all you want to do is read that Bible. Do you remember those days? Do you remember those days of the newness of life in Christ? Do you remember how God implanted within you new desires? The old passed away, behold, the new has come. We once loved sin. We once uh, catered to the passions of our flesh. We loved the world. Do you remember those times when holiness gripped your heart? You wanted to be like Jesus. Do you remember those times when it was a pure delight to just know him? The Ephesians had lost the awe of new life, which led to the newness of first love. The honeymoon phase in the Christian life, guess what? It's not supposed to end. And I'm not talking you're always going to be uh, you know, flying around all excited. But first love is not to end. It is to intensify. It is to mature. It is to become characteristic of the Christian life. So the first thing we see then in the presence of, of first love, it is the newness of life that we once had reignited again. The new desires for the other world, the new desires for holiness, the new desires for the things of God begin to grip you with fervency and that when you have to make a decision, the world or the word, the world never even gets a hold of you. I don't want that. That's my old person. What? Are you kidding me? I have a new delight. And it's found here. But also in the newness that they had lost of, of new life in Christ, and thus the loss of first love, there was also the loss of new direction for life. You know what first love? It gives you a new compass in which to live your life. If I was to ask you right now to write down three purposes uh, that you are right now living your life, what would you tell me? Raise my kids right. That's a good one. Be a good wife, good husband. That's a good one. Serve my neighbor, that's a good one. But you know what your number one direction in life is? It's Paul's, Philippians 1.21, to live as Christ. To live as Christ. Get that one, all the other ones come together. But you start with all the other ones, then Christ becomes secondary. Christ takes a third, maybe even a third seat in your life. New life in Christ, producing new uh, first love in Christ, 
It intensifies desires for Him. It intensifies and directs life in all things. There's another area marking the healthiness of first love. Not only is the newness, but there's also enthusiasm. How many of you rolled out of bed uh, this, mo- this morning and was jumping up and down that you got to go to church? I'm sure some of you did. But how many of you just said, I guess I better go? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Well, we could stream it. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not bashing those who, I'm not, please don't take that. We're streaming for a reason, to serve those who are not ready to come back and for those who, you know, who, who can't come back. But be very cautious about that. Church, cal- uh, uh, church on the couch is easy. I wouldn't know. I mean, I was going to try that one Sunday, but <laughs> probably wouldn't have worked too well. Are you enthusiastic about your Christian life? Are you enthusiastic about God perhaps reviving us and being an agent of change in the culture? You know, when first love is thriving, there is enthusiasm about the Christian life. And we could say there is a zeal about the Christian life. If you're lacking zeal, and I'm going to give you five areas, and we're going to stop with that today. If you're lacking zeal in your Christian life, I'm not talking about emotionalism, but I'm talking about a Holy Spirit-empowered zeal. If you're lacking that, first love is lost. We are told, cursed is the person who does the work of the Lord with slackness. Paul tells us, be zealous, be diligent. Octavius Winslow said this, Quote, love flowing from the heart of Jesus into the heart of a poor believing sinner, expelling selfishness, melting coldness, conquering sinfulness, and drawing that heart up in a simple and unreserved surrender is of all principles of action the most powerful and sanctifying force in the earth. Under the constraining influence of this this principle, how easy becomes every cross for Jesus, how light every burden, how pleasant every yoke. Duties become privileges, difficulties banish, delay or procrastination is rebuked. That's what first love does. It destroys sloth. It produces zeal. And here's what first love present will produce. Areas of zeal, five. And I want to finish this next five minutes. Five areas of zeal. We'll review these again next week. These will always be present when first love is thriving. Number one, there'll be zeal for God's word. The psalmist in 119, 127 says, Therefore I love your commandments above gold. Is there anything that you cherish more in life than the Bible? Job says, I have treasured the words of of his mouth more than my food. Remember in the honeymoon stage that you couldn't get enough of the Bible? You'd rather rather spend two hours reading your Bible than two hours on Netflix. You'd rather pull away and, and read through your Bible than to sit around and do mindless nothing. First love produces zeal for God's word. I'm actually going to close with this one since we're out of time. But I want to tell you this story, a true story, about zeal for God's word. It happened a long time ago in France. There once lived a poor blind girl. She'd obtained the gospel of Mark in raised letters, in Braille. And she learned to read it by the tips of her fingers, the gospel of Mark. By constant reading, her fingers became callous, and her sense of touch diminished until she could not distinguish the characters. One day she cut the skin from the ends of her fingers to increase their sensitivity, but only to destroy it. She felt that she must now give up her beloved book. And weeping, she pressed the Bible, the Gospel of Mark, to her lips, saying, farewell, farewell, sweet word of my heavenly Father. To her surprise, her lips were more delicate than her fingers. She discerned the form of the letters, and all night she read with her lips the word of God and overflowed with joy at this new ability to read the Bible. 
you like to stand with her in your desire for the Bible? Would I? The only hope for our world is the recovery of first love that mobilizes the church to put forth the sweet fragrance of Jesus Christ in the gospel that changes hearts one at a time. And that vehicle is a revived church, the church that has recovered first love. It's a first love that understands God empowers us to love. It's a first love that provides new desires in life. It's a first love that provides new direction in life for me to live as Christ, period. And it produces areas of zeal. And first, there's the zeal for God's word. You simply can't get enough of his word. You want it to know him. And you will not sacrifice, you will not sacrifice time in the word on the altars of the world. Entertainment, recreation, worldly whatever. You won't do it. Why? Because first love has drawn you to behold the one in his word who first loved you so that you could love him. May God help us as we continue to look at recovery of first love. Father, we honor you and thank you for your word. And Lord, please, this is a very real area I know in my life. And may you show us if we've lost first love and grant us, grant us the work of repentance. And may we go back and do the first works and recover first love. And may it be for the glory of Christ, the healing of our nation, the restoration of, of relationships and families and communities that have been fractured because of sin. And may you teach us. But more importantly, may we be teachable, moldable, changed into him who loved us. For Christ's sake, amen. If you are able to, please stand with us for the benediction and then continue standing uh, as we sing the doxology thereafter. The benediction comes from Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Amen.